person in, in terms of his physical energy and his capacity to, to uh, keep on going. And uh, that in itself, I think, is, is what moves things in this country at the moment. I think that, you know, all things going well, uh, he'll go down in history as the man who put Indonesia back together, the man who took it from the brink of disaster when it seemed that the whole thing would fall apart. It doesn't stop. Mm. It's like one schedule after another, one meeting after another, and he doesn't give us time to breathe, basically. It's, he wears us out. Really, he made us, you know, tired mm. all the time. But he himself just keeps on going. We are still uh, have many problems. I think before being fleshed out, those problems will uh, still uh, make the you know the investors to be doubtful about. It. 60-year-old Abdurrahman Wahid is in charge of one of the world's most fractious nations. He's guiding 210 million people through historic and traumatic change. So, because in this we have to be careful. Despite the pressure of that job and his own precarious health, the president still has time to visit an old and ailing friend. Abdul Rahman Wahid is no stranger to hospitals. He's a stroke survivor and he's clinically blind. But we're visiting Jakarta's central hospital to see Uma Khayyam, one of Indonesia's most venerated nationalist writers. Their shared ideal of a proud nation has been weakened by years of violence and corruption. But where one man is succumbing to the frailties of old age, the other is steadfastly refusing to give in to his own physical problems. Wahid is hoping his eyesight will be helped with a daily course of Chinese herbs administered through this cannula. As Indonesia's latest leader, Abdul Rahman Wahid is variously accused of being erratic, volatile, abrasive and politically clumsy. But there does seem to be method in the muddling ways of this blind Muslim cleric. It's already late in the day, but Indonesia's president still has several more hours of crucial work ahead of him. He's on his way to a secret meeting. It's a meeting so sensitive it's been called not in the presidential palace, but in the president's private family home on the outskirts of Jakarta's southern suburbs. This is the president's 17th such meeting with student and religious leaders from the rebellious breakaway province of Aceh, and one at which he's keen to portray himself as an equal and a man prepared to listen. Arche, the restless precinct at the northern tip of his archipelago, is one of Wahid's most difficult issues. Inspired by the ultimate outcome in East Timor, Archinese are pressing harder than ever for independence. A campaign that left 93 dead in January alone. This scene of apparent conciliation would have been inconceivable under strongman Suharto. He kept a lid on Arche with savage military repression. Wahid wants to keep the resource-rich province as well. National stability depends on it. But all he wants to use are words and wily diplomacy. <laughs> 
ngomong dulu sama aku Kamu gimana ini? Kok gak ada kesinggul itu? Ini Pak Amir Iya Gus Dur itu kan seorang yang humanis ya Humanis yang religi Jadi saya melihat Ya kalau selama yang saya kenal ya Beliau orangnya sangat familiar Sederhana Terus mau mendengar omongan orang lain ya. Jadi <tuh> Sangat komunikatif Yang selama ini saya mengikuti beliau udah. Beyond Arche, the ties that bind this disparate nation together are fraying on many fronts. Here in Indonesia's far east province of West Papua, formerly Irian Jaya, Papuan locals are demanding a greater share of the area's rich resources. And that's fueling demands for independence. Elsewhere in the east, the Maluku Islands and their centerpiece Ambon have been a bloodbath of hatred between Christians and Muslims. There have been extraordinary scenes here, a port filled with refugees desperate to leave. Villages razed and an army accused of inaction, even complicity. They look at Ambon and they look at Arche and they say the president and the government isn't doing enough. Well, of course, we have to be careful. You see, we know how to, to, to deal with the matter, uh, sometimes slowly and later quicker. So what do you think is causing the problem in Ambon? Uh, a bunch of politicians uh, began to change the situation. Previously, the balance uh, of uh, government uh, was that, uh, you see, uh, between the Christians and the Muslims, uh, you see, the, the division of uh, the so-called quote-unquote spoils will be uh, see, even. But then uh, came Habibi, came Suharto, when they both uh, tilted toward the toward Islamic groups, then they did the terrible thing of uh, you see, uh, of uh, taking over all the so-called uh, important Christian positions in the province. And so head on into Indonesia's great disgrace, where many of his fellow politicians would fear to tread, Abdurrahman Wahid last week touched down in what can only be described even now as enemy territory, East Timor. With the heat barely out of the militia-led slaughter here, not surprisingly, there was protest. It was a bold move for a frail Indonesian, and while one simple visit could never absolve Indonesia of the terrible sins it committed here, his act of contrition was brave and historic. Atas apa yang buruk telah terjadi di masa lampau, baik kepada keluarga, dan teman-teman korban Santa Cruz serta teman-teman dan keluarga dari mereka yang dikuburkan di Taman Pahlawan ini. Dua-duanya adalah korban dari keadaan yang tidak kita kehendaki. The fact that he is going to East Timor soon after the killing, the destruction of East Timor, with the hardliner still resentful over the loss of East Timor, shows also his goodwill, his courage. Wahid's overture here may also help mend his nation's relationship with Australia, even though the president's still testy about how his neighbour played the independence ballot, which sparked the bloody upheaval. It's not John Howard, but it's uh, the Australian government. They used uh, unbalanced policy vis-à-vis uh, -vis the integrationist in the plebiscite. For me, it's not important whether uh, they decided to go, you see, the, the, the Timorese, to go to, to be independent or not, or the, I don't care. But, but the process itself has to be, you know, to be uh, 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 in a way uh, uh, without any mistake, without, without something wrong.
At the Sea of Knowledge Islamic Boarding School, time hasn't changed tradition. It was here in the small town of Jombang, East Java, the man they now called Gustur started his education. But his old schoolmate Amanullah, now head religious teacher here, remembers a mischievous truant who sometimes failed grades. It was not the sort of behaviour expected of a boy with a deep clerical heritage. Both grandfathers and his father were Muslim scholars. Gus means the son of a religious teacher, Dur, a friendly contraction of Abdul Rahman. Gustur's father became independent Indonesia's first religious affairs minister. But in 1953, tragedy struck and a wayward boy was forced onto the straight and narrow. He was in a car with his dad driving to a, uh, an Enu meeting uh, outside Jakarta. The car was struck from behind. His father was fatally wounded. Uh, he was only 12 years old. Uh, and his mother effectively said from that point on, look, you know, you come from an impressive uh, lineage. You've got a lot to live up to. Uh, your father's mantle is yours now. Amanat President Republic Indonesia, Bapak Kiai Haji Abdurrahman Wahid. After studies in Cairo and Baghdad, Gus Dur returned a moderate, worldly and reformist teacher. <laughs> As an outspoken Muslim cleric, he quickly rose to lead these men, the Muslim teachers who make up the world's largest Islamic organisation, the 35 million strong Nadulatul Ulama, his eventual springboard to presidential power. He now runs the country with the same disarming, earthy humour with which he ran the mullahs. But for years, his liberal views clashed with Suharto's iron fist control, a dangerous game indeed. I remember one stage, one, one time when I was still in junior high school, and he told me, he said, you know, just be prepared if someone would take me away and you won't see me again. My father said that, that there were an order from Suharto to, uh, yeah, to eliminate my father. He was courageous in criticising Suharto. Uh, I think even back, you know, as, as chairman of Nathal Lama, he occasionally thought, well, if the chance comes, you know, what would I do as president? I think it really began to dawn on him after the, the fall of Suharto and the, the formation of new parties, this, you know, sudden efflorescence of, of new political activity. <laughs> One of his first presidential initiatives was to overturn state repression of Indonesia's Chinese minority, a people often persecuted in the bloody power games of Jakarta's army-dominated elite. For the first time in Indonesia's independent history, Confucians are allowed to hold a cultural event publicly. And, for the first time, a president is guest of honour. Dan mereka yang merasa terpanggil untuk itu juga harus memperjuangkan upaya melakukan koreksi tersebut. His concession to ethnic Chinese arose from a little hard-nosed economics. Comprising just 5% of the population, these people control 70% of the country's wealth. By returning their cultural dignity and celebrating diversity, Gustur has convinced ethnic Chinese to keep their capital in his Indonesia. Uh, at least this is an indicator 
indicator that uh, the government uh, give us the our human right, uh, give us back our human right. As you know, our duty are the same with, with other citizens. Appeasing an oppressed minority is one thing, but curbing the power of Indonesia's oppressors is, of course, a much tougher assignment. Indonesia's Human Rights Commission has implicated former Army Commander-in-Chief General Wiranto in the East Timor killings. The Attorney General is now deciding if he has a criminal case to answer. While that investigation is underway, President Wahid wanted General Wiranto to resign. Wiranto refused. For days, the President prevaricated, changed his mind and confused just about everyone with haphazard statements many took as weakness. He managed to confound uh, everybody. And uh, in the end, I think uh, the bottom line is he shows courage. He moves uh, very, in a very shrewd way, uh, playing chess with uh, the generals. On the day of Wahid's return from a European trip, he backed down and allowed Wiranto to stay on as a minister. Many took the capitulation as a death knell for reform and accountability. But Wahid turned defeat into the greatest victory so far of his short presidency. The second day, in order to uh, uh, avoid the possibility of, uh, uh, of the uh, International Court uh, uh, to preside over him because of his uh, recalcitrant uh, uh, way of uh, uh, not following the orders to resign or request to resign, then, you know, they... So I, 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 I said that I will not activate him and that's what happened. A non-activated Wiranto meant suspended for the duration of the investigation. But in reality, Wiranto's public life is finished. You've said also that he will receive a pardon if found guilty. Some people, some people might ask what sort of justice that is. Oh no, it's, that's an important one. I mean, uh, he, he was a commander of the armed forces. So like President Suharto and the vice presidents, as well as uh, 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 commanders of the armed forces of that time, should be pardoned if they are found guilty. Otherwise, we will antagonize the, 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 the institution. And I don't like to antagonize the army. On the face of it, Gustur's preemptive pardon looks like a sop to a powerful and pervasive military. And yet, even those you'd have thought would be deeply opposed to a reprieve for Wiranto and the military leadership concede there's merit in Wahid's tactics. Let's remember, if there is a trial, Wiranto and all the other generals are going to be thoroughly exposed for the first time ever in the history of Indonesia that a whole gang of Indonesian generals are put on trial. And that is tremendously important. That is a tremendous political message with unpredictable consequences. So if Wahid believes that he should soften uh, the political atmosphere by saying, don't worry, I will pardon you, but you go through the trial, well, the trial itself is going to be humiliating a lesson to the generals. At the end of the day, I think what needs to be uh, taken as the benchmark is that are we every day closer to the objective of civilian supremacy? And he delivers. And the whole issue uh, regarding General Viranto is precisely symbolic of that overall process. 
While he won his battle of wits with Moronto, the unpredictable public statements he used to do it raised concern about his style. His major weakness is, is, is the way he miscommunicates. It's a great paradox or a great irony because he is a supremely gifted communicator, but sometimes he miscommunicates very badly, um, either because he's shooting from the hip or because he's not explaining his actions. Relations are again cool with his old religious rival, but important parliamentary ally, Armin Reis, who backs Wahid, but attacks what he calls flip-flop leadership. I think it is dangerous, uh, because if you have a uh, flip-flop leadership, and then the public will be confused. If uh, you say A in the morning, and then you say something else in the evening, and the day after that you say something else, I think uh, the people will be confused, and uh, nobody can uh, have good planning uh, regarding the, the future. When you say that there are some people criticizing, you've got to know what kind of people actually criticize him because the people, his constituencies actually love him, love this kind of style because they feel that they're close to him. Mm. We've got people coming in here and they just sit here and eat with him here on the floor. I mean, and the paper is carried out as, you know, this is just one tremendous transformation from a palace that was not accessible to the people at all to one that, that uh, people can actually feel that it belongs to them. On the presidential jet, Gustur shrugs off criticism of his unpredictable style. Let them, let them confuse them. <laughs> you know, because uh, uh, this is necessary. Because uh, you, in this situation, you have to do that, in that way. You cannot go straight. I think even people close to him would sometimes say, look, it'd be good if he just you know, slow down and thought sometimes before making his statements. On the other hand, he's often proven right, you know, after a due course of time. And at least some of the time, the statements are very carefully calculated in order to, to test a response. I think uh, maybe those of us who keep saying that, uh, well, he's quite contradictory, maybe he's laughing at us because he's, he is consistent in this regard. What is important is that Wahid is consistent in terms of his uh, uh, support for democracy, for justice, for tolerance. He is an incredibly uh, compassionate uh, individual. That uh, you can rest assured, he's very consistent on that. Mm. So if he uh, is ambiguous for tactical reasons, well, uh, that is his strength. Maybe that's why he managed to be president. What is your message there to the, to the military that the fact that they can go to trial? Well, they have to be honest. I mean, uh, between the military and the civilians, there is no difference. Both have to has to have to do to uh, establish rule of law, respect for law. With the hardline generals on the back foot, Gusto's tour of duty continues apace. We're with him on another internal flight one of many this week, this time to Indonesia's ancient capital of Yogyakarta in East Java. It's part of his ongoing mission of public assurance. But the relentless schedule he's framed for himself raises another public concern, his health. This is a man who's suffered not one, but two strokes. He's also battling diabetes. Those strokes quite amazingly, miraculously perhaps, didn't leave any permanent damage uh, of consequence, uh, but it means that there's a, there's a concern that there could be another stroke. As a consequence, his health is being monitored, uh, his blood pressure is checked three times a day, you know, there's great attention given to, to, to just see that he's kept out of the danger zone that might bring on another stroke. Do you think you can keep up this pace, uh, getting up at 4.30 and finishing at 12.30? Do you think people are worried about that? I hope that, uh, you see, I will, you know, when I feel uh, something, yeah, that will happen, maybe sickness or that, I just stop. If to I cope with the crisis schedule, Gustur still rises early, very early, for his daily exercise. It's 4.30 a.m. and he's up and not quite running in the presidential gardens. It's a discipline he's followed since rising for the Islamic boarding school classes 
where he first heard the collection of Muslim maxims he now uses to run the country and even applied to win power. President. But Tamin Rais also saw that if Megawati uh, took the uh, presidency, then the nation will be at civil war. And here he applied another, you know, another principle <laughs> to avoid trouble is more important or given priority over bringing good results. <laughs> So, you know, both apply the principles, different principles of the same uh, legal maxim, why I do fit, and it end up by myself being president and the Gawati by president. <laughs> While he's coming to terms with his physical challenges, it's no secret this widely read scholar hopes one day to regain his eyesight. But it matters little to his political vision. If his performance so far is anything to go by, many in Indonesia hope he stays well enough to steer her through an unpredictable transition. The cost of his failure will be great. Okay, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.